Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 14th Critical Issues Forum. I'm Youngha Park from Asian Studies Department, and I'll serve as a moderator for today's talk and Q&A session. As many of you know, this is one of our biggest and most important events of the year, and I'm thrilled that the topic of today's event is Korean popular culture. There are many CKS faculty and students who treat Korean popular culture as a serious academic subject in their teaching and research. So we are really excited to hear from a scholar who does cutting ed edge research in this subfield. Before we start formal speeches, I'd like to thank the CKS director, Taeung Baek, and uh, the staff, Hain Lee and Ye Jung Kwon, who worked very hard on organizing this, this event. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, um, let me invite Professor Taeung Baek, who will give his welcoming remarks. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Center for Korean Studies. I'm director of this center, a professor of law, and uh, my name is Taeung Baek. I'm very delighted to host this 14th uh, Critical Issues Forum uh, with a very distinguished guest, uh, Professor Michel Jo from University of Toronto. And my son goes to University of Toronto. <laughs> very, uh, I think, thankful for coming to this, uh, you know, long places, uh, faraway places. So let me briefly speak about the Forum on Critical Issues in Korean Studies. Uh, this forum was inaugurated in 2010 to bring outstanding scholars from around the world to the University of Hawaii Manoa campus for discussions of important contemporary topics related to Korea. I this morning thought, uh, who started this? And it's Professor Hagen Gu and his clan, and now Professor Hagen Gu is here, even if he has retired. So thank you very much for initiating this important talk series. The workshop identifies major issues which are currently of great intellectual interest among scholars of Korean studies across disciplinary fields and hold one workshop each year on a given topic. The workshop invitees make one public presentation at the CKSM meeting with the interest in CKS faculty and graduate students. So, so far we had, have had the honor to invite the following excellent speakers to this forum uh, since 2010. Choi Jang-jip, Kim Woo Chang, Bang Myung-nim, Nancy Eberman, Johan Hye-jung, Kwon Hoenik, Andre Schmidt, Bruce Cummings, Janet Poor, Bang Myung-nim, Kim Hyun-mi, Vladimir Tikhonov, Kim Su-kyung, Lee Yung-kyung, and Shin jin -woo. And now our 14th speaker is Professor Michel Jo. Uh, this event, the 14th Annual Forum, is very, very uh, important because we also have uh, uh, desired to host a talk on Korean popular culture, and we finally have it. And this event is supported by Du Uk and the Helen Nam Choi Fund. And uh, today's session has been organized under the leadership of a Professor Yonga Park, Asian Studies. And uh, I understand uh, Professor Hye Jin Lee will give an uh, introduction today, and she will be also moderating a conversation with Dr. Joe tomorrow morning at 10.30 a.m. So thank you for working very hard for this event. And I would like to mention not only uh, uh, the great work that Ye Jun is providing. There are also other students, staff here, and also Hain Lee, and many people had been working together. So I would like to uh, acknowledge their great uh, efforts to make this successful. And I'm also thankful for, for all of you uh, coming uh, today. So I'm now uh, handing over this micro pro microphone back to Professor Park uh, for uh, further in introduction and discussion. I will be disappearing just in my seat, enjoying the discussion. We'll not be coming back again. Thank you very much. Okay, so next, I'd like to welcome Professor Hye Jin Lee from the Department of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies, who will formally introduce the speaker to us. Hi, everyone. Excuse my voice. I'm going to try to project and not sound too terrible here. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon um, at such an important event. I'm so honored to introduce our guest speaker, 
Michelle Cho is Assistant Professor of Korean Media and Cinema Studies at the University of Toronto. Her work explores contemporary South Korean genre cinemas, Korean television, K-pop's politicization on digital platforms, and histories of race and racialization in K-pop and its fandoms. She is co-editor of Pangtan Remixed, a critical BTS reader, forthcoming, and author of the forthcoming monograph, Genre Worlds, Global, Global Forms, and Millennial South Korean Cinema. Her public-facing writing appears in such venues as the Los Angeles Re Review of Books, and she's a frequent commenter on Asian media in outlets ranging from NPR to, C to the CBC, CNN, Al Jazeera, and the Washington Post. She once hosted a public conversation between Hallyu stars and BFFs Lee Jung Jae and Chung Woo Sung at the Toronto International Film Festival. Now, I know for some of us, this recent explosion of Hallyu, right, as symbolized by BTS, is a recent phenomenon. But Professor Jo has been studying, researching, and commenting on this phenomenon for the last 20 years. And we're so honored to have you here and to learn from you. Please join me in welcoming Professor Jo. Oh, thank you so very much for that kind introduction. And uh, my sincere thanks to the Center for Korean Studies, to its director, Taeung Peck, and Young Ah Park for the invitation. And uh, so much thanks to um, Ye Jin Kwon and um, Hae and Lee for all of their help in making this visit possible. Um, I have to admit that um, I was ex especially excited to get this invitation, not just because Hawaii is such a beautiful place, and so it's a treat to be able to be here, especially in the winter. Uh, Toronto is wonderful, but it does have very cold winter weather. Um, but I was also really excited because I am working out some new ideas for a project that I've I'm currently working on, and so being able to get feedback from this audience in particular um, is really important to me because I would imagine that being uh, Hawaii being where it is in the Pacific, um, it must be a space where some of the dynamics that I'm talking about in terms of the reception of Korean media and popular culture are especially vibrant. So. I very much look forward to hearing your questions and comments. Um, and so I'm going to begin, um, I'll be reading part of my talk and then also just talking through some of the slides. And I have a lot of media examples. So um, hopefully there will be some um, fun clips and, and music to kind of lift us up with a good mood this, this afternoon. Okay, so I'm gonna begin. Um, this study comes from my current project that for now I'm calling Vicarious Media, K-Culture and New Paradigms of the Parasocial. I mainly position this work as a media studies intervention to redefine the concept of the parasocial from the way that it's long been understood in simple human-to-human -human terms. In other words, the parasocial is thought to be a fantasized, as in fake, social relation between a media consumer and a celebrity that's cultivated through repeated media representation of that celebrity figure. In contrast to this notion of parasociality, my work redefines parasociality as the interplay of human and algorithmic agency that centers on vicariousness or vicarious experience as a primary goal and central product of contemporary media cultures. In this work, I build on um, media theorist Tom Lamar's recent work on Japanese television and transmedia ecologies, from which I was inspired to adapt his media ecological framework to discuss Korean retro aesthetics. So what I hope to do today is give you, one, a quick definition of transmedia as media ecology, elaborating why an ecological approach is required to discuss the Hallyu phenomenon, Two, lay out the multiple genealogies of Korean retro across different media fields. And then finally, to discuss what today's retro aesthetics allow us to understand anew in presenting the recent past as a speculative and in many ways fantastic escape from the present. In other words, retro aesthetics and their associated genres often pose alternative pasts 
as access points to fantasized futures, offering a circular logic in which what used to be morphs into what could have been in order to produce contemporary images of a hopeful future in the face of the intractable dilemmas of intensifying political, economic, and gender polarization and attendant social alienation and the intractable impacts of ecological crisis. So we're going to get <laughs> to that towards the end of the talk, but first, the good vibes. So a retro phase has permeated South Korean pop cultural contents for the last several years across media and taste cultures ranging from fashion to film to television to popular music. But is neutro, which is the term that's used to describe this phenomenon, merely a localized Korean version of the American return to the 1990s trend from the 2010s, driven by Gen Z's curious obsession with TV sitcom, the TV sitcom Friends, or Hollywood's revival of the 1980s in TV shows like Stranger Things or film franchise reboots like the new Indiana Jones? In my presentation today, I argue that the answer isn't so simple and requires us to reconsider a number of questions. First, how to understand transnational pop cultural trends beyond the usual cultural hegemony explanations, that is, that the US shapes culture everywhere else in a unidirectional flow of influence. And second, the ways in which contemporary horizons of human knowledge, culture, and experience are today being produced by an assemblage of human and non-human entities. This is an urgent question of paramount importance as we will see such effects accelerate with the rapid development of AI. This is why I present here an attempt to map out a transmedia ecology of new retro. So let me explain with that uh, what an ecological approach can yield and lay out the media genealogies of Korean new retro. So most discussions of popular culture in the context of Hallyu, or Korean wave culture industries, and the K-culture soft power project are strongly humanistic, emphasizing the artists, whether cinema auteurs or entertainment industry celebrities, whose unique talents serve as evidence of an exceptional national culture. What also needs consideration are the ways in which technological devices and networks are also drivers of the Hallyu phenomenon. This isn't meant to di diminish the talent and hard work that have undoubtedly contributed to the success of such globally visible artists and exempl exemplary works as BTS, Pong Juno's Parasite, or Huang, Huang dong -yuk's Squid Game. However, I will argue that looking more closely at the widespread appearance of retro aesthetics in South Korean commercial culture may yield a more illuminating set of conclusions than the study of such celebrated and singular cases as those I've just mentioned. Today's deep dive into retro aesthetics demonstrates how algorithmic agency or the programmed feedback loops of technological platforms facilitates the capture of digital flows of collective affect, producing an integrated cybernetic system of human actors and platform capabilities. This interplay allows us to then assess the cultural forces and social dilemmas pointed to by such popular trends. Um, I apologize, we'll get to the fun stuff in a second, but I'm just kind of laying out the frameworks here, so bear with me for a second. So transmedia is an increasingly common buzzword, both in media studies scholarship and media industries, such that the study of single media forms, such as print, radio, television, film, or digital media, are understood by now to be rather outdated. Transmedia refers to this decline in boundaries between media forms that's resulted from both media industry practices, such as the development of media franchises that move characters and story worlds across multiple media formats, and audience reception practices that cultivate attachments to such franchises across media types. In the case of Korean wave media production, distribution, and reception practices, transmedia strategies abound. For example, in which K-pop artists and management companies create narrative worlds for their acts, such as SM Entertainment's Kwangya or the Bangtan Universe, to cultivate fan engagement across virtual spaces of digital media platforms, as well as the physical spaces of fan meetings and concerts. Other examples include the growth of webtoon adaptations across K-drama and film production, and the platform-driven growth of Korea's Korean content's visibility and market share 
through streaming platforms like Netflix, Viki.com, and Amazon Prime Video, among others, and the rise of powerful fan networks on YouTube, TikTok, and Twitter X. A media ecological approach sees media production, distribution, and reception in networked, interconnected ways, viewing the cultural object through its context and media in both its material characteristics and its social significance. I would argue that Korean media must be studied ecologically, since the individual products of the Korean wave circulate and transform within a much broader transnational media ecosystem, given the foundational impacts of transnational platforms, especially YouTube and Netflix, to the ways that Hallyu transpires today. Media ecology refrains from privileging human agency and activity, but instead investigates how technology becomes an interactive field that brings multiple forces together in an interlocking assemblage. So to return to the genealogies of Korean New Retro, let me talk about its transition points through popular screen media and then platform convergences starting in the early 2010s. So yeah, here you have what I have come up with as what I see as intertwining genealogies um, between 2012 and 2023, which, and, and really we could date this to the present, when I think this retro trend has really taken hold of every aspect of Korean pop cultural production. So I'm going to start off by talking a bit about retro aesthetics and the desires that they, I think, reflect in film and television. And then I'll shift into the platform story, which I think is a really important one and is increasingly the dominant driver of these, this neutro retro revival. Okay, so... Oops. So according to Korean film critics and also audiences, there was a turning point in 2012 with this film, um, Architecture 101, Kanchu Kakeron, which introduced the idea of a nostalgic 1990s that um, the film is set in and that brings back this memory of uh, the 1990s as a kind of golden period of youth culture. Um, so this is clearly in the film space and um, this kind of develops and grows, this 90s craze, and there are several representative works that take on these characteristics of nostalgia, film, and TV. So some of their characteristics involve a voiceover narration, flashback structure, um, a youth or coming-of-age story, um, the highlighting of various facets of liberalizing South Korean society at the time, um, you know, whether that involves the consumption of media from other places um, or the kind of political and economic shifts that are occurring at the time. And then there's usually the pairing of a kind of spunky heroine and a sad or frustrated hero, um, which opens out into a larger uh, social world through the characters, um, the side characters that are kind of circulating around this central couple. Um, the Reply series, which I don't know if those of you here are familiar with, are a really good example of this kind of retro trend that um, kind of follows on the, the popularity of this return to the 90s um, that is initiated in the 2010s. And um, what I found really interesting about the Reply series is the way that this really formative, transformative historical period um, just prior to and then during um, the IMF crisis is represented in ways that actually um, they, they underplay the impacts of the IMF crisis. So what's very interesting about the Reply series is also that it uses the resources of media archives and the actual physical media of the time in order to cultivate viewer nostalgia. And so there are many examples of physical media and physical media devices that are used in the show to give the show kind of uh, indexical quality, uh, a realism in a way, even if the stories um, that are featured are also quite, quite ideal, idealized. So um, I'm just going to show you a clip from Ngdapara uh, the first installment, Reply 1997, 
which gives you a sense of the way that these media are used to bring the viewer back to a certain period. And this would be the period of the early internet. of a protagonist who is a fangirl and the power of popular culture consumption to create a kind of unified communal sense sensibility and this being a hallmark of the generation that this um, protagonist belongs to. So um, from that clip, I wanted to point your attention to, okay, there we go, um, the appearance of Star Docu, which was an actual television show that was produced during the time. And so there's an integration of media archives, even if um, you know the, the scene is staged in a particular way with an older <laughs> Tony An, um, who is a member of HOT, <laughs> um, because that is an early K-pop group that this um, protagonist is a huge fan of. And so... The show is very strategically using the appearance of archival media along with other instances in which the media that's shown in the show actually is from that time period to create a kind of unified reality sense that the show is presenting. Um, this is um, the one point in the show where the IMF crisis, um, which is, you know, the... the um, the financial crisis that um, really impacted the Korean economy in 1997-98 um, and is a very uh, formative experience for a lot of people who were living in Korea during that time. Um, this is the only mention of it in the show. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. 
한 쌍의 커플이 결혼 발표를 한다. 야, 근데 너 결혼 부산에서 서울에서 해? 야, 부산에서 하면 안 되냐? 오랜만에 집에 좀 가자. 너 집은 샀어? 얘또 무식한 소리하고 앉아있는데 요즘 누가 집을 사니? 어제 경기가 나라망했다던 IMF 때부터 다온 것 같아. That last line where the character says that the economy now is worse than during the IMF is clearly a kind of, it's, it's not necessarily fact. But more of a uh, sentiment based on current perceptions. Um, and this show does a lot to then diminish the impact of that historical event by framing it in these ways. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with the show, it has this flashback structure where you're introduced to the characters in the present, and the present of that show is 2012. And then you get flashbacks to 1997, which is where a lot of the action takes place when both characters were high school students. So this trend of going back to um, the past as a way of um, providing an opportunity for viewers to collectively engage in a nostalgic relationship to that recent past is continued in two prequels, um, the Re Answer Me or Reply 1994 and Reply 1988. So, the Reply 1994 series, it comes out fairly soon after the success of Reply 1997, um, so in 2013, and it concerns uh, pre-IMF college uh, youth culture, and um, so you have the two protagonists there. And then the latest, but paradoxically earliest in history, <laughs> um, installment of the show is Reply 1988, and this remains one of the most popular cable television shows ever produced in South Korea, and it has a very enduring afterlife. Um, it was produced in um, 2015, 2016, and it continues to be available today on Netflix. <laughs> so um, this uh, kind of life, the afterlife of this show, which was originally broadcast as a TV show on TVN, a uh, Korean cable network, and now exists as a um, media, a form of media that you can access on streaming sites, is going to lead me into a discussion of platforms and the process um, that media scholars refer to as platformization. According to communication studies researchers David Nieborg and Thomas Pohl, Platformization is a process through which digital platforms not only change the typical production practices and distribution circuits of cultural content, for example, um, in the way that they can move film, television, and popular music away from movie theaters, TV networks, radio, or record stores, to content streaming platforms like YouTube, Netflix, and Spotify, but in the process actually change the ontological status of the cultural commodity itself. So the cultural text, the film, TV show, or song, is no longer a fixed entity, but instead becomes radically contingent and context-dependent. Nieborg and Paul write, quote, Cultural content producers have to continuously grapple with seemingly serendipitous changes in platform governance, ranging from content curation to pricing strategies. Simultaneously, these producers are enticed by new platform services and infrastructural changes. In the process, cultural commodities become fundamentally contingent, that is, increasingly modular in design and continuously reworked and repackaged, informed by datafied feed user feedback. Um, so we see the impacts of this platformization process if we trace the convergence of Reply 1988's depiction of the late 1980s and the revival of South Korean pop hits from that period, which also coincide with the platform-driven revival of a genre of music um, called Japanese city pop, reinforcing the sense of a widespread cultural shift towards late 20th century cultural styles and the affects they produce, nostalgia for popular culture before the internet and social media, constituting an ironic use of the ability of platforms to recontextualize content, which is the end point of um, Nieborg and Pohl's account of platformization as a process, in order to imagine a time before cultural content was itself subject to platformization. Um, so I want to talk about the way that Reply 1988 spurs a 80s Korean pop revival, um, and that the impacts of this revival are seen not just in 
the sharing of archival footage from that period on platforms like YouTube, but then also end up affecting the the new music and new new cultural production that we see in South Korea as well. So this is a clip from Reply 1988. Um, it's actually a fan edited one that. Uh, showcases some of the 1980s pop hits that the show featured that then lead to renewed interest in the artists who uh, made these, these songs. So it's humorous because the, the protagonist of Reply 1988 is seen dancing to these, these, um, these songs. Um, but then I'll show you the way that um, this leads to the archival kind of uh, life of these new songs then um, bringing in more interests by viewers who then upload um, fans who upload these videos onto YouTube and then share them with the public. the original artists performing those, those tracks. Um, Kim Hyo Sun had, you know, kind of big revival because the popularity of her music, uh, which a lot of fans encountered through um, from my 1988, um, and kind of remembered. And so um, she actually has been on some television shows in South Korea. Um, and she's still, you know, very beautiful and able to perform the music that she was performing back in the 1980s. Um, but this is the song that you heard. I chose this clip in particular because it has features of the kind of breeziness, the, the sense of uh, illusion. Um, it seemed quite fitting for <laughs> And also because I'm going to be talking about this a lot, these aesthetics, um, and the idea of breezy, breezy affluence that also are so important to the way that city pop signifies. Um, so this is the same artist, Lee Sang Eun, um, with a track that actually fits much more into the sonic uh, aesthetic qualities of city, city pop, pop, which, which I'm going to turn to next. next.
interest after they featured in this contemporary television show um, like Reply 1988, they coincide with an interest on the part of Korean um, Koreans who either lived during that period and then later those who didn't to revive a certain kind of nostalgia for this late 20th century culture that um, circulates and exists before the internet. So there's a certain irony of using the internet, especially internet-enabled platforms like YouTube, in order to access a structure of feeling, a kind of um, innocent um, youth cultural vibe of 1980s, 90s era affluence. Um, and so this is the impact that I'm arguing that platformization has in creating this ability to move across time and to re-signify this earlier cultural production in service of a contemporary set of concerns. So, um, so yeah, so this paradoxical nostalgia that I'm talking about, um, especially on the part of young people who didn't experience this time, um, it's... A similar kind of nostalgia is what New York Times reporter Lou Stoppard describes in his style article, Gen Z Channels the 1990s. Um, Stoppard writes this in December 2023, just a few months ago, um, and he says, there's, quote, a vivid irony to a generation using smartphones and the internet as a portal to a less online age in order to fantasize about limiting their reliance on technology. In the United States, the 90s were years of unprecedented prosperity under Bill Clinton, a time before mass precarity is emblematized by casualized labor and the gig economy, but also before school shootings and the threat of terrorism and, the, and pandemic threats. So the innocent time seemingly insulated from the consequences of American foreign policy and aggressive economic globalization came home to roost, so to speak. In other words, the American 1990s are characterized by the breezy and innocent structures of feeling that also characterize Japan's 1970s and 80s, what's referred to as Japan's bubble era, which is why it seems that the vibes of the retro trend, wherever it manifests, mashes up multiple decades from the 60s to the early 2000s, such that neutro in South Korea can now refer to visual and sonic elements from any early historical period. Um, and so I was looking up uh, oops. No information about Neutro, and it's very much this um, unequivocally internet enabled phenomenon. And it is a new form of a kind of return to the past or nostalgia aesthetics that is specifically about using the internet in this way to kind of recapture, a, uh, to turn history primarily into an affective structure, a set of vibes. Um, and so you look up Neutro and you get a whole assemblage of different images. Um, okay, so these bubble vibes <laughs> can also attach to earlier 20th century genres of popular music and screen media that were circulated by Hollywood and through the physical and ideological infrastructures of the Cold War, especially by the expansive network of U.S. military bases scattered throughout the free world. So it's important to recall that Japanese city pop itself was a localized version of this U.S.-inspired post-war consumer fantasy, and this is where I'll now shift to explain what I see as the second part of the genealogy of Korean New Retro, where media sharing on YouTube and Spotify further consolidates the transnational exchange of retro aesthetics. Um, city pop had its heyday from the late 1970s through the 1980s, and its sounds include elements of disco, funk, and R&B, combined with synthesizer elements pioneered by devices invented and produced in Japan, including the Roland TR-808, first sold in 1980, and of course the Roland 808 would serve, as a, key, serve a key function within the most influential pop music genre um, of the late 20th century, that is hip-hop. 
But the device's use in Japanese city pop may explain what affective appeal its futuristic machine-produced percussion sounds held later in the 20th century, and what appeal it still holds today for the many who now romanticize that period through their media consumption. A Rolling Stone journalist writing in 2019 describes Japanese city pop as, quote, an opulent amalgamation of pop, disco, funk, R&B, boogie, jazz, fusion, Latin, Caribbean, and Polynesian music, and attributed the genre's emergence and popularity to a 1980s tech-fueled economic bubble and the wealthy new leisure class uh, it created. Many American music critics write writing on the genre, whose most visible year in English language media coverage seems to be 2019, declare city pop to be less strict in terms of genre than a broad vibe classification. So what is this vibe? It's a sense of urbane sophistication, music made, quote, music made by city people for city people, end quote. This is according to a Japanese music producer who's quoted in the Rolling Stone. Um, the city pop vibe is simultaneously chill and carefree. Um, it's redolent of the tropical breezes wafting around such city people as they enjoy resort vacations. As a decadent form of culture, born of Japanese high growth economy, Japan's high growth economy, city pop mediates multiple contradictions, imagining city life as one of leisure, lightness, and abundance. Japanese literature scholar Tomiko Yoda discusses light novels of the 1980s in similar terms as the shiny surface covering the dark forces of ennui and boredom, which lay just beneath the bubble economy's shining veneer. City pop would fade into obscurity in the recessionary 1990s, relatively ignored by Japanese listeners and Japanophiles, until the platform mediated revival of the genre from the mid-2010s. Um, in a widely shared essay for Pitchfork from 2021, critic Kat Zhang calls city pop's life cycle endless. It now forever circulates and recirculates through recommendation algorithms on two dominant transnational platforms, YouTube and TikTok. Both of these video sharing platforms have been crucial drivers of K-pop's popularity in the same period as the city pop rebirth. And it seems quite likely that K-pop's earlier success on YouTube um, contributed to City Pop's platform promotion, since many fans have testified to the anime to K-pop trajectory of their video consumption habits or vice versa. Another key to Korean cultural producers' contributions to 21st century City Pop um, begins with the South Korean DJ Night Tempo, who posted a remix of the famous City Pop track Plastic Love by Maria Takeuchi on the platform. So this is that video. And the cover image of this video is actually from Sailor Moon. So there's also a very direct anime connection in terms of the way that City Pop is um, So this is an, the original recording by Taki Uchi Maria with a Korean lyric transliteration and translation uploaded by a Korean City Pop fan. And you'll hear that you know the, the night tempo remix, it just sped up the beat a tiny bit. Um, but the earlier track is just a bit more languid. Um, video by Night Tempo garnered millions of views before it was struck by a copyright claim. However, mil uh, many versions of this remix also circulate on SoundCloud and Spotify, and music streaming platforms uh, continue to be important drivers of City Pop's current success. Indeed, the genre seems to capture the contemporary zeitgeist um, and has given birth to a number of uh, other Asian City Pop 
revivals, which are kind of imaginings of the music that would have been made at the time if the trend of city pop had been available, I guess, in, in that locality. So there's also a Korean city pop now that follows on um, this popular resurgence of Japanese city pop. Um, okay, uh, Korean musicologist Chung Woo Sik's article, The Process of Forming City Pop and Considerations on the Popularity of 21st Century City Pop from the journal Tejung Umak, or Popular Music, mentions Night Tempo's Plastic Love Remix as a strong influence on driving a domestic Korean city pop scene. Another key mediator of the invention of K-City Pop was singer-songwriters, singer-songwriter Pek Yedin's 2018 cover of the song La 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 Love Song, um, and we are going to skip over those for, for time. Um, but that was a cover of a Japanese song that was originally written for a 1996 um, TV show, a, t a J-drama, um, and was a reference to the 1981 album A Long Vacation um, by Eiichi Otaki, a pioneer of 80s Japanese city pop. Peck Yedin's adoption of the city pop trend to take part in the phenomenon of Gen Z Neutro is matched by her contemporaries in the Korean pop industry, inspired both by city pop's ubiquity as an online sound culture and by K-drama and film-driven revivals um, of earlier hit makers. So I'll just skip ahead to some of those tracks, um, which are like contemporary. We can go forward, yeah. Um, so there are some contemporary Korean musicians who are kind of following on this city pop trend to incorporate elements of city pop sound into contemporary Korean music. So um, this is a track by Sunmi, um, which I believe is a reference to um, a 1990 track by Kang Suzy that I just uh, skipped over, but we can listen to a little bit of that. And then um, this is even more a direct uh, reference to City Pop in a Twice track from 2020. Okay, so I'm going to breeze through some of these conclusions because I feel like I've tried to lay out this genealogy and the movement between uh, different music cultures and the way that they're all playing on this kind of retro um, aesthetic as a set of sonic elements, but also a, a set of vibes, I guess, or a kind of affective structure. Um, and again, that structure brings the possibility of a kind of breezy... Um, feel to the present that for many listeners and fans of city pop and, and of this neutral trend feels inaccessible given contemporary politics and, and economic issue. So it seems to me that the appeal of these retro aesthetics, especially in their citation in contemporary media culture, um, aims to return uh, to a kind of earlier hopeful time, <laughs> um, in this case, in the South Korean context, the decade between democratization and financial crisis, because that's really the time period, the time frame that's highlighted by both the TV series Reply uh, 97, 94, and 88, as well as um, these kind of city pop references. Again, it's all about a certain optimism associated with high growth economics and the kind of leisure spaces and um, like easy breezy feel that such an economic uh, climate was thought to, to make possible. Um, the flip side to the neutral trend, that it, which, is, which feels to me like a kind of mirror opposite, is the prevalence of dystopian representations of the present. So you are probably familiar with a lot of these. Um, they all are characterized by a certain representation of the present as an unlivable space, um, one that doesn't really afford a future. Um, you know, 
Concrete Utopia is a great example from very recently um, that kind of represents the breakdown of, of social structures. And so if in Korean popular culture today, we're bouncing back and forth, kind of ping-ponging between this dystopian representation and then retro, neutro, um, there doesn't seem to be anything that resembles a kind of livable, breathable space in the present. Um, so what I see as the kind of lesson of this, like, binary between nostalgic and dystopian representation is a kind of um, maybe prompt to us as fans and consumers of Hallyu, of, of this contemporary cultural um, field, uh, as a way of thinking about what these accumulated um, forms will can, can allow us to access. Because I guess I've, I've made a kind of synthetic argument here that by looking at the impacts of platformization and the way that these trends are moving across spaces and contexts, um, we actually can get a grasp and start to um, start to theorize what all of this says to us about the contemporary moment. So I would almost say that new retro youth cultures can function as an, a form of inverted social critique. So if we take pains to historicize, to kind of re- um, bring back in a historical sensibility to the cultural amnesia that can be cultivated by the retro trend, the blending of all of these different specific periods into just a generic feeling of pastness as a better time, um, then we can get to a, again, a more critical mode of engagement with Hallyu culture. And the other thing that I want us to take away from my presentation today is, again, to think not just about individuals, individual consumers, individuals, you know, who use platforms, but also the impact of the algorithmic elements of platforms that really shape these connections, these pathways, and the fact that, you know, just as much as we are shaping um, the technology that we use, we're also being shaped by it. So we should be aware of that. Um, so thank you so much for listening. I know I went on too long and um, I am just kind of formulating these ideas here. So I appreciate your attention and I look forward to your feedback. Thank you. Yes, Harrison. Yes, yes, please. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. That was uh, wonderful. Um, so um, this fascination with the, the past while portraying the present as a place of crisis, it almost parallels kind of like the neoliberal agenda of the past as the good old days, the present constantly under crisis, mm -hmm. therefore subject to austerity measures, cuts, structural adjustment. So, so what I'm, so, you know, within this whole um, domain of pleasure and enjoyment and all the fun that we have while enjoying these products. I, I can't help but to, but to kind of see the, the um, underlying force of capital at, at work here. I mean, it's precisely how, you know, um, contemporary capitalist system works, right? Mm -hmm. they, they are exploiting the past, the president is always bad. That's why we must continue to expand the neoliberal agenda and so forth. So, so do you also see this kind of parallel um, happening here, this phenomenon, where it is also following the code of, of capitalist expansion? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, your comment is um, really important. And I think, you know, maybe by proposing that there is a critical potential in the retro aesthetic, um, the retro aesthetic trend, I'm being overly optimistic because I'm trying to actually get people to like think more about what it is that draws them to certain things, what that enjoyment is that you experience when you see mm -hmm. this media. Um, you know, I think that a lot of young people are actually, um, 
they're thinking about this and talking about this. You can see it in the comments on YouTube um, where they're like, why am I transported to, you know, 1980s Tokyo? I'm 18 and, you know, I'm in my room scrolling during the pandemic. And so they're sort of, you know, taking it upon themselves to kind of talk about the how appealing this kind of fantasy bubble, you know, image can be. Um, I think it's also really interesting because basically the platform affordances that I was talking about, um, they are really, um, you know, they, they, there's a dialectic to their usage because on the one hand, the more you participate in platform economies, the more you're kind of drawn in and, and tied up in the way that the platforms are extracting value from you through your user data. Um, but at the same time, this ends up being this space, the kind of virtual space that um, fans are using in order to communicate with each other and form um, form community. And so, and there are also, you know, kind of counter hegemonic uses of platforms. And so, it's not just one thing or the other. But certainly, what you're describing in the expansion of the retro aesthetic to just generate more and more and more kind of commercial media. Certainly um, just an example of the way that, um, yeah, the, the culture industries are operating and kind of using sentiment um, to profit. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Marie? Hi, um, thank you. Can you talk about the relationship between the sociocultural political commentary made by, for instance, I've only watched 1988 yeah. in the reply series, but in that, yes, as you talked about, there are lots of reference use portrayal of the media culture, consumption mm -hmm. of media culture, mm -hmm. but there are also lots of stuff that go on in the drama that's not about that, right? So what I'm thinking specific, one of the things that was quite striking to me watching the show is that there's this very brief reference to the student protest. Yeah. Right, the protagonist participates for a very short time, and then and then she somehow stops, and then no reference to it. So, like, what's the socio larger socio political commentary made by the show as a whole, mm -hmm. and how does the media portrayal fit into that? Right, right. So, what I think is really interesting about um, Reply 1988, and I wasn't able to kind of talk about this in my formal presentation, is that. I think that it's a show that confirms um, the thesis that, you know, Myung Ji Young and Hagen Koo are talking about of this middle class um, kind of declining or the way that the middle class seems to be a kind of um, lost dream, you know, of some kind um, that now middle class existence is uh, just fraught with anxiety. And I think that the 1980s kind of communal cultures that are being dis displayed or portrayed in the show are versions of a kind of dreamed for or, or wished for lost capacity to kind of grow together, you know, to um, not be in competition with one another, but instead to kind of imagine um, a kind of uplift for an entire neighborhood, an entire community. Um, it's really interesting that um, in uh, reply 1988, you do see a little bit of the student organizing um, that was very active during that period um, through the older sister character. Um, but it's kind of there to give a kind of cultural flavor of a certain authenticity and maybe to, again, spur some memories on the part of yours who are around the same age. Um, as or had gone through similar experiences, but it's really not contextualized at all. I mean, it's as in the same way that, you know, the IMF is mentioned, of course, because it needs to be, because it was so important um, as an event at the time, but then it's sort of decontextualized and moved on from very, very quickly. And it's a way of just kind of um, dating, I guess, the, the portrayal. Um, so, yeah, I think that the the larger kind of commentary of Reply 1988 is to kind of recapture this dream of middle class collective uplift. But it's presented in this fantastical form, you know, like it's so, so romanticized. Thank you so much for your uh, wonderful presentation. Um, I'm a history PhD candidate. I'm working on like mostly 
post-war modern Japan, like related to sort of dichotomy between rural, urban, um, urban and rural areas and something to do with moder- modernity. Yeah. So I, I was very interested in your presentation. So thanks so much. Um, my question uh, with regards to sort of various understanding of modernities, because um, I, I, when I was listening to your presentation, I thought that the people who actually lived at that time almost felt as if they were kind of critical of the modernity that they were living at that time, right? But um, for those who haven't lived, want to pursue that particular kind of modernity. So it's as if they're like you have multiple versions of modernities and there's always kind of competing elements to it. So I was wondering, like, what do you see in that? And mm-hmm. then it's, this is more like a tangential question. And uh, because your title of the presentation is uh, trans- Transmedia and Transnational Media, I was wondering if you um, are thinking of incorporating more of like a bedroom pop or sort of like a different sort of um, music genre that involved a lot of nostalgic elements. Mm Because if you look at artists like a lot of like Claro or like Tim Impala, like they're, they're from Massachusetts and some guys from Australia. But they are doing very similar nature to like that of Japanese people or Korean people, right? So it, it it's not right, at this point defined by ethnic groups or identity, mm-hmm. right? So, yeah. So I was curious about that. Thank you so much. Yeah, totally. Maybe I'll answer the second question first because I need to think more about the first question. But um, so it's really interesting to think about the kind of transnational reach of city pop. Um, because it became really, really trendy starting in the 2010s, um, from the mid-2010s onwards. And that's where I think maybe um, the, you know, musicians that you just mentioned who are appealing to that same kind of genre, past sound, and incorporating those elements into their music might have been influenced. Because it's, it's really a... The revival of city pop is a Western phenomenon in the sense that, you know, collectors and DJs um, discover that this music existed and it sounds really exotic but familiar at the same time. And, you know, not coincidentally, that's the way that K-pop is often described. Um, But, you know, uh, there was a lot of uh, interest in the form um, during that mid-2010s period into the 2020s. And then it really kind of exploded too during the pandemic because I think we were online so much. Um, And so a lot of the writers and critics who are writing about city pop um, sort of exoticize it nonetheless because they're writing from a North American perspective um, and they're kind of looking for rare grooves that they can then kind of show their esoteric tastes by. Um, But I, I dispute, I guess, the way that people write about city pop as, you know, appealing because it's essentially just American music made in Japan, because, you know, if you said the same thing about K-pop, that it is American music made in Korea, um, that's just a, a radical oversimplification, because no, it's it's a localized form of a certain set of transnationally circulating um, aesthetic elements, and the fact that it's made in Japan in the 70s and 80s, or in K-pop's case, made in Korea in the 90s, to, into the 2000s is important, and it's going to imbue that that cultural object um, with particularities of its place of origin. Um, it's not just you know American music then repackaged mm-hmm. and sold back to North Americans largely who are remarking at how interesting it is, right? So um, I wanted to actually show the way that city pop is taken up by Koreans um, because you know. In the, like, South Koreans are subject to the same kind of algorithmic forces that are bringing this music into the playlists or the kind of, you know, homepages of various YouTube users in North America. And so they're also seeing it. And there's this really strong, again, like, um, anime connection, K-pop connection. Um, and also, I don't know if you all are familiar with the lo-fi girl studying. <laughs> A lot of the tracks that make it onto that channel are city pop tracks. So that was another vector of the 
kind of explosion of city pop at that particular moment of the 20, mid 2010s. Um, to talk about maybe like multiple modernities and to think about the way that the media trajectory that I'm laying out here um, can help us maybe to think through some of those questions. I mean, I think, um, yeah, I mean, this kind of makes me think back to Harrison's question as well. Of like, you know, what are we seeing here a nostalgia that is just a kind of familiar form that has been characteristic of modernity and modern culture, you know, forever, <laughs> where um, a romanticization of the past is some way of then critiquing the present um, or also... Um, contrasting the present with what came before, what that which is not modern. And I think with this like new retro, new um, new platform enabled um, trend that seems to be unstoppably, you know, an unstoppable aesthetic, it just like proliferates in every direction nowadays. Um, there's like a conspicuous disinterest in in some ways in historical accuracy. There's no sense of authenticity that matters anymore. And I guess I wonder if that difference, um, or what difference that difference makes, if that makes sense. And so that's something that I'm really trying to mull over. You know, it's not just a kind of postmodern relativism, uh, because there's a lot of sincerity <laughs> that you find in the way that, you know, individuals are consuming this media. It makes them feel a lot of things, and that's what they primarily comment on. Um, but it is also like very uninterested and unconcerned with uh, historical accuracy, authenticity, et cetera. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, any other questions? Professor Beck? Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a wonderful uh, presentation, and I learned a lot. While listening to your presentation, I was constantly questioning uh, when, while you are talking about new retro. Older, older retro is it different, and what kind of a uh, uh, impact this uh, you know K-pop music has over the people's sentiment on the past? So in in, in old days, I thought the Korean people are always uh, emphasizing Han or sadness or poverty or some some kind of a you know negative feeling that we had had in the past but i realized that in those uh, drama or music we do not talk much about han or difficult times so is korean culture changing and is people's kind of a identity that is reflected in the culture changing yeah. Oh, that's a wonderful question. Thank you. And something that I've thought about a lot, because I was really trying to figure out what is distinctive about this current retro trend, because there are a lot of examples of earlier cultural works that also go to the past, obviously, right? Um, you know, like Sunny in 2011, or um, Chingu, that film that revisits the 70s. Paka um, Satang, you know, like, but what those film examples do is they return to a culture of authoritarianism. And yeah, the past really is this kind of um, repository of national violence that's been overcome in this like post-democracy um, period. And I think that that's really the distinction in this new retro, where the new retro is um, it's erasing all of that and it's just looking at the past, especially the 1980s and 90s, as a kind of utopian space, um, also knowing that that's impossible. So there's almost this kind of science fictional or speculative element. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, I, I think that's a really fundamental change and it seems to be a generational change because um, a lot of this media consumption that I talked about today, it's really driven by, um, I mean, MZ or, you know, these kind of younger folks. And um, they are kind of simultaneously very melancholic. Like, I know that this is all just compensation for the fact that I'm lonely and isolated and, you know, I don't have the opportunity to cultivate, you know, like fun times with my friends. Some of it is pandemic era, so they really were locked in their rooms. Um, but yeah, so there's a kind of deep melancholy that 
is there under the surface of this kind of um, lightness and enjoyment of this like breezy mood. Yeah. Okay. David had a question. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you so much for this talk. Um, I taught a course on Korean popular culture last semester, and this was actually the first lecture subject. So it was very enlightening to hear you know, someone who's much more of an expert talk about it. Um, but listening to you talk, I was wondering about, you know, in terms of these retro, um, the retro aesthetic that permeates so much popular culture in South Korea, I wonder if we need to differentiate between, um, you know, the kind of products like the Reply series that are very specific and almost self-conscious in, um, you know, highlighting the retroness of, you know, what they're trying to do in the sense that they're actually providing the dates up front. And part of the appeal of the show is to recognize songs or particular technology or fashion items. Um, so there's that kind of product category. Product maybe is not the right word, but maybe it is. Um, and then something like, um, you know, the pop idol group New Jeans, which so much of their aesthetic is retro. Yeah. And, but it's a kind of diffuse retro, non-specific retro, and it's also a retro that I wonder, you know, so much of the target audience for New Jeans is the, you know, the MZ generation yeah. who might not recognize any of the references, even when the references are very specific. They mm -hmm. have a video, for example, that seems so much... Um, you know, inspired by the aesthetics of Iwai Shunji movies from like the, the early 2000s, late 1990s. Yeah. And I just like wonder how many of their target audience are actually recognizing it. And it's clear that, you know, the, the references are coming because the people making the creative decisions, the director of the video, they're probably around my age. They're not mm -hmm. the age of, you know, the, the singers of this group. Um, and I'm just kind of wondering, like, differentiating between, like, this non-specific, I don't even know if the references are being caught by the target audience, and this other kind that seems to be appealing to people who actually lived during the generation, or at least mm. actively recognizing all of the references. Yeah, that's, that's great. And that distinction, I think, is important. Um, I think that the Reply series is really interesting because it... I think is also being produced by people for whom those reference points are really important as markers of a personal history. Um, and it matters that every element that can build the realism of its depiction of that specific time are accurate, right? Um, and so I think it's using the kind of indexical quality of archival media in order to like buttress or shore up that reality effect. Um, but what I think is really interesting is that um, that retro trend of appealing to people who would have a kind of personal history from that period um, also converges or has a role to play in a kind of genealogical sense um, in this new retro trend that is very different, as you just described it so beautifully. Um, so, yeah, it used to be the case that, you know, this kind of retro um, aesthetic was really there to appeal to people who would have a personal nostalgia over, you know, what they were seeing. And the Reply series is very much a part of that. But then it spurs this platform-mediated, um, you know, less specific nostalgia, the neutro that I've been talking about, which is a kind of marketing term in a lot of ways. Um, and that builds, I think, on what these earlier media texts made possible. Um, it's great that you talked about new genes, because I was like, oh, I could definitely talk about new genes as part of this trajectory. And it's so clear that uh, the producers behind this group are older people, you know, because they're bringing in all of these references. Um, yeah, like not just Iwai Shinji, but, you know, there's like K-horror elements and, you know, some of the videos. There's Tony Leung showing up in one of their videos, right? And I think that New Jeans is kind of masterfully 
reaching both audiences at once. I mean, it's almost like uh, a new kind of development in this in the efficacy of this retro trend to be able to operate both on you know these this older generation who might be um, into it because it brings back these personal memories and this younger generation who are just attracted to the vibe. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Oh, okay. I, I have a question. Yeah, please. Um, so I was curious. Um, so you use the term uh, transmedia ecology and mm -hmm. you talked about the platformization of, uh, you know, uh, neutro. Um, and, you know, when you kind of phrase it that way, it seems like the role of human agency is somewhat diminished. Uh, you know, but then you also talked about, um, you know, this um, uh, what is a, uh, kind of a nostalgia as social critique. Yeah. Uh, how do they kind of come together? You, mm -hmm. know, because, you know, because when we talk about social critique, right, there's this, um, there's definitely this element of human agency, right? So how do they kind of come together? <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you for, for that question. I mean, it's interesting because the um, the idea of the transnational or the transmedia ecosystem or ecology is really important to me in trying to um, make sure that I'm addressing um, both human actors, you know, fans, media mm -hmm. users, media consumers, and platforms and how platforms work and, you know, their main goal, which is to mm -hmm. spur additional media consumption mm -hmm. together, that, you know, they're coming together as an assemblage. Um, and so I think that this approach is maybe missing in a lot of Hallyu studies, which mm. is, I think, why I'm trying to mm. bring it more to the foreground. Mm -hmm. um, but when I'm talking about, like, yeah, uh, new retro aesthetics as a kind of complaint almost on the part of this young mm -hmm. generation, um, and if pushed, if, if kind of made to think more about the historical factors that are maybe driving this mm -hmm. dissatisfaction with the present that mm -hmm. perhaps, you know, it could be the seedbed perhaps of a, a social critique mm -hmm. from a generational perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, um, yeah, the, the idea of the media ecology doesn't necessarily, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost kind of fighting against mm -hmm. <laughs> that possibility that that the audience would sort of be a little bit more reflexive about their media consumption, you know, what it may be that's dri driving them to be attracted to this kind of content. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah, I guess, yeah, I can see the kind of contradiction in, in the way that I'm trying to put all of these propositions forward, mm -hmm. um, but I don't see them as mutually exclusive either, I guess, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, any final questions? Oh yes, Lucy, I think we have five more minutes. Hi, uh, thank you so much for your talk, it's been really fascinating. Um, I think um, a lot of your work seems to deal with uh, emotions, right, in these effective structures you've talked about. Um, how do you, as an academic, as a writer, approach emotion, something that's so kind of undefiable, unquantifiable, um, when researching popular culture? And, and why was it important for you to have that, that aspect? Yeah, oh, that's such a good question. Thank you. Um, so I think I would answer the question a couple of ways. Like first, I think that there are certain areas of study that privilege, you know, a kind of fan, like feeling or structure of feeling um, that don't necessarily have to present academic study as divorced from emotions or, you know, there, there's not this... Um, idea that you have to be objective about the thing that you are studying. And so I gravitate more to that, um, that sensibility or that approach, I think, to popular culture. Um, I often think that, you know, the emotions that one feels about the object of study that you have actually can make you more critical, more attentive, more invested. And that's actually a really good thing. 
Um, but so yeah, um, within the space of fan studies, for instance, it's kind of just taken for granted that you talk about stuff because there's something about it that you like. <laughs> um, and so this is not something, again, that compromises your authority as a, you know, investigator of that thing, but it gives you access into like more, more aspects of its kind of social life. Um, so I think that that's kind of how I think about the role of, you know, emotion in the kind of pop culture research that I do. Um, it is hard to talk about feelings. I mean, it's, it's sometimes, um, I mean, affect studies is this whole kind of big area of theorization where people are trying to talk about, um, you know, I mean, affect is a term that's used as opposed to emotion because it's something like emotion and sensation together. Or sometimes there's not an, a coherent and stable enough like term or label to describe a particular feeling. Um, and so that's definitely a big part of what I'm interested in looking at and the reactions to this kind of media or you know, what desires or drives are pushing people to you know, certain media over others or how media is affecting the audience um, and how that changes based on you know, where you're talking about um, who you're talking about, you know, the, the kind of demographic variations and the geographical, cultural distinctions. Um, so all of that is just all very contextual, context-based. So I would say I always try to privilege the specific context of a particular, you know, media exchange that might be happening in order to make sure that I'm attentive to the way that um, popular media is not just one thing, but its actual status changes depending on where you're talking, yeah, talking about. Thank you. Okay, if not, I think we can wrap up here. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you and so thanks much. thanks for coming. I appreciate your attention very much.